Oh boy, oh boy, oh boy, oh boy, boy. There is so much to talk about. Good morning. It is Tuesday, December 14, 2021. I'm Kenny Polcari, your host of the party. And I don't even know where to start with all the stuff that's going on, right? There is an elephant in the room and his name is Dumbo, right? We should remember that, right? The market weakness is not about Omicron, Delta, or even the COVID-19 uh, uh, variants, right? The PPI report, which is expected to come out at 8.30 today, is going to be hotter than already the hot estimates. The Fed announcement tomorrow is all about rates. The question is about rates, not about taper. And what are we having for dinner tonight? I'm giving you the linguini puttanesca, but I'll tell you about that uh, in a minute. So look, you see the Main Street media yesterday is trying to convince us that the market's weakness was all about Omicron variant and how it's spread across the world and how it's more transmissible. Yet it's not any more deadly. It's not causing death and destruction. News that the UK Prime Minister Boris Johnson announced that one person has died of the variant since it was introduced to the world three weeks ago seemed to take over the headlines as if it's the beginning of death and destruction. That's one person in the whole world that I've heard of that's died of Omicron, right? And then they run with a variety of headlines that all detail the same thing. China, of all places, has found the variant on their mainland. Well, considering it originated there, why is that a news story? Of course it's there, as are a handful of other variants, I'm sure, that are going to start to pose a challenge. And that's also posing a challenge for China's zero tolerance strategy. Then add in the latest indoor mask mandates in both New York and California, regardless of your status, and that only added to the angst. Pfizer coming out and saying that maybe two doses are enough and maybe it's not. They seem to protect people uh, against hospitalization as they push for the additional third shot, right? That booster. Moderna keeps telling us, oh, no, no, no. We need to tweak the current vaccine to address this issue so everyone needs to line up, get another shot. So again, you can just hear the cash register going cha-ching. Okay, look, we get it. We get it. But it's not the reason that stock sold off yesterday at all. It has nothing to do with the virus or any variant or any variant that's yet to come. So from a market's perspective, forget COVID, forget Delta, forget Omicron and any other variant that showed it the world. In the end, it is becoming clearer that this is not going to go away anytime soon and that we're going to need to learn to live with it without getting hysterical with every headline or every new variant that comes out. It's just not. Right, So we, we need to put that in its proper place. Stocks around the world yesterday sold off on Monday uh, because analysts and strategists got a chance to digest the hot CPI reading from Friday and what that now is going to mean uh, for the Fed heads as they begin their two-day meeting today. Economic data today is all about the producer price index uh, and what that's going to say about the cost of inputs at the manufacturing producer level and then what that means for future CPI readings, right? Toss in the upcoming wave of global central bank policy decisions throughout this week from the Bank of Japan, Bank of England, and the European Central Bank and we have enough monetary data to keep the pot boiling. Look, so many of us have been telling the story for months now that inflation, rates, bond yields, and, and, and uh, the Fed policy story, all while others have been trying to ignore that data, saying, ah, don't worry, it's not an issue. Does, uh, it's not an issue that appears to be, right? Everything's good. Everything's under control. Well, guess what? It is the issue that it appears to be. There is no debating that. Inflation is hot, and it is running out of control. The Fed has all but admitted that. And now they appear to be behind the eight ball, a place they told us they would not be. Rate hikes are going to move faster than what market expectations are. And that's going to cause valuations to come down. Look, it's not a disaster. It's a math problem. It's not an investment problem per se. Yeah, it's an investment problem. They have to pick the right stocks or pick the right plan or talk to your advisor. But it's not the end of the world. Look, it's not difficult. It is what it is. It was the talk of rate hikes coming as soon as next month, January of 2022, that gave investors something to think about. It was talk of an even swifter taper that gave investors something to think about. It was the talk of Fed credibility that gave investors something to think about yesterday. And it was all these issues that gave investors a reason to pause and stocks to back off. European stocks, which were up nicely in the early morning, also ended the day in negative territory. U.S. stocks, which tried to rally yesterday morning, failed miserably 
as the day wore on, getting weaker and weaker as the clock ticked, minute by minute. By the end of the day, the Dow gave back 320, uh, 320 points or nine tenths of a percent. The S&P's lost 44 points, nine tenths of a percent. The NASDAQ choked, falling 218 points or 1.4 percent. The Russell lost 32 points, 1.4 percent, while the transports gave back 190 points or 1.2 percent. The weakness that we saw and are seeing is the realization that everything we've been told over the past 10 months anyway is not true. Inflation is not transitory. In fact, it is hotter than what we've been hearing. Rates are going up much sooner than originally expected and will most likely go hand in hand with the tapering, which is something else that Jay told us would never happen. So in fact, the sta that statement isn't true either. And we haven't even gotten today's PPI report, which is also expected to blow the roof off the house. And in this case, that's not a good report. The PPI report is expected to come in at 9.2%. But remember, the whisper number has a 10 handle on it. And if that's the case, get ready for another push lower. And that is what the issue is. Forget COVID, forget Delta, forget Omicron. None of that is driving the action unless they use it to create even more hysteria in a down market, then it'll be just one more negative headline to accompany the negative Fed headlines, and that's going to add angst on top of angst, right? So if they use it that way, then yeah, of course, but I, I, I think it's way overblown. As you might expect, the sexy high growth names came under pressure, followed by small and mid cap names, right? The tech ETF down 1.5%, Russell down 1.4% as investors kind of digested it. The XRT, which is the retail ETF, which was up 65% through November 16th on a strong consumer and that, that explosive holiday shopping season, which by the way began in August and has now run its course, is off 14% in three weeks. As talk of inflation and swifter taper and rising rates takes its toll. But before you go and light your hair on fire, the stock is still up 39% on the year. That's a 15% outperformance versus the broader market. So what's everyone yapping about? Yesterday's uh, utilities outperformed yesterday, rising 1.2% as investors view them as the safety trade. They're utilities, they're boring, but they're great dividend payers, and so that's good going forward. Consumer staples, the XLP, things like toothpaste, soap, detergents, deodorant, underwear, socks, etc., also finding a bit as well, rising 1.3% in a down market. They too are typically dividend payers. Consumer discretionary, XLY, though, got whacked, falling 2.6% as higher rates and swifter table could mean the end of a strong economy and the end of discretionary spending dollars. Because you see, for the Fed to really slow this down now, if it's really that out of control, they're going to have to create a recession. The tech, the XLK lost 1.5, energy down 2.7, home build is down uh, 1.9, the growth trade falling 1.15%, while the value trade gave up just a half a percent. Apple, which was only cents away from becoming a $3 trillion company, also failed, falling 2% to end the day at 175.74. Travel and leisure stocks sank, crypto sank, taking Bitcoin down 6% or $3,000 a coin to end the day at 46800 But there's more to the crypto story than what they're telling you. Think tax loss, tax loss selling into year end. Look, here's the secret that they aren't telling you about the recent weakness in cryptos, Bitcoin, Ethereum, and a host of the others. Investors can leverage losses in those assets differently than what is allowed for stocks and mutual funds. Enter the wash rule exemption. Now, the wash rule prevents you from selling any security or mutual fund at a loss and then buying it back within 30 days, essentially replacing the, the, the position you had, right? You can't do that, but you can in cryptos. So investors in cryptos can sell them for a loss, then use that loss to offset or eliminate capital gains on any other winning investments, and then turn around and immediately buy back the same crypto that they just sold without penalty, so that they don't miss the rebound that is sure to come in the new year. So think about this. If you bought Bitcoin at 60000 then you sold it at 45000 you take a $15,000 loss against any gain, and then turn right around and buy back that crypto that you just sold at $45,000 for $45,000. So now you take the loss on the gains, and then establish a new average price for your crypto investment. So the year-end weakness makes perfect sense if you think of it as a tax strategy, which is exactly what it is. 
There's nothing more. So again, stop the hysteria about the weakness in crypto and understand the reasons why we're seeing that weakness, right? Treasury prices climbed yesterday, sending yields lower. This morning, the 10-year treasury is yielding 1.43%. But remember, the Fed is still buying treasuries. You must wait until they really start to pull back. Uh, and at the rate they're going, that could, that's going to be more obvious in probably January, early February versus what we originally thought might have been uh, late April or early May, right? We're going to hear more about that tomorrow when the Fed makes the announcement. This morning, U.S. futures are a bit weak. Dow futures down 10 points, S&P's down 10, NASDAQ's down 88, the Russell's ahead by three. But remember, the Russell got hit harder yesterday than the broader market. So that little bounce in the Russell is not really anything to write home about. Everyone's waiting for the 8.30 meeting. Right When the government announces the latest PPI report, by now you know it's expected to be hotter and the Wisp number even hotter. The surprise is going to be if the number is weaker than the expectation. Not sure how they'll be able to explain that away, but if it is, it's going to be very interesting to watch uh, how they suddenly tell us that uh, inflation is, is calming down when it's all been about panic inflation. Wednesday brings us the last FOMC announcement for the year. It's going to be about inflation, tapering, and interest rates. Later in the week, we're going to hear from the other global central banks, right? So expect all of this to be at the top of the agenda as the week progresses. This morning, European markets are just a bit higher as they digest all of this. Omicron is not the focus at all. Eco data and central bank policy is the focus. UK employment data came in strong, 257,000 new jobs. And that's making some wonder what the Bank of England is going to say about rates on Thursday. Will they ignore the virus or are they going to allow it to continue to dictate policy? We're about to find out uh, across a range of countries, right, including us in the next few days. At 6.30 this morning, European markets were all up about a quarter, of a quarter to a half a percent kind of across the board. Oil this morning is trading at $71.15 a barrel, just down a little bit after it tries to stabilize after yesterday's uh, beating. There's no specific oil data out uh, today, so I just suspect it churns right in line. I still think it's going to have an upward bias because I still think demand is alive and well, but you all make your own decision. The S&P closed at 46.68 yesterday, and it appears to be muted this morning as we all await the PPI report. Once that comes out, then expect all the talking heads to speculate on what the Fed's going to say about it tomorrow. If it's as strong as expected, the Fed's going to have no choice but to push back uh, and push that rate hike narrative right up to the front line. And while I don't think it happens in January... There is a very real possibility that it does. They could surprise and just throw in the towel and say, look, we need to do this. And if so, you strap in because stocks will take a hit. Now, listen, remember what I think. I think if you're, it depends if you're a long-term investor, you need to stay the course. You need to build in some downside protection to blunt any losses. There's no reason to sell good stocks, especially if the thesis for why you own them has not changed. Why are you going to throw your Apple out just because some people, you know, there's a whole lot of reasons people sell stocks like that. But why are you going to throw your Apple out just because it's weak? Uh, makes no sense to me. Whatever. Remember, you can text the word invest at 21000 on your cell phone. You're going to get my digital business card. Feel free to download it. Send me off an email or a text. I'm always happy to engage uh, with you and talk about markets, right? You know, you can follow me on Twitter and TikTok at Kenny Polcari and on Instagram at Kenny P. 1961. So I know yesterday I told you I'm going to start to give you all the desserts we have for Christmas Eve, and I'm going to continue to do that. But over the weekend, I made linguine puttanesca as a dinner for a dinner party that we had. I featured the, uh, the picture online, and one of my Twitter followers said to me, can you post the recipe? So I'm giving you and that Twitter follower the recipe that he requested. So here you go. It's la the linguine puttanesca. Now look. It's so funny because the word puttanesca literally translates into uh, in the style of the prostitute, where the Italian word puttana means lady of the evening. Okay, that's just the history of it. Um, I'm not making any comments. I'm just giving you the history. As many of you know, this dish originated in Naples, and it is today a staple of the Neapolitan household. It's made from tomatoes. Black olives or calamata olives, one or the other. Don't mix them. Capers, anchovies, onions, garlic, oregano, and parsley. It's easy to make uh, with its in, and, it, and it has that interesting history, right? Whatever its origin, though, it's a great dish and it's easy to prepare. It's spicy, tangy, and vibrant. And it's an appropriate description for actually what's happening in the market today, right? 
So here's what you're going to do. You're going to start with three crushed cloves of, uh, of uh, garlic, sauteed in olive oil uh, for about three or four minutes. You know what you want to do. You want to brown it. Don't let it burn. Now act, add in the diced white onion and the diced minced anchovy fillets and saute for another five to eight minutes as they cook. Uh, the anchovies are going to melt away, so don't worry about that. It just gives it the flavor, right? Um, after you've got it all sautéed and the onions are nice and, and uh, soft, you're going to add one can of uh, crushed tomatoes, not puree. You want kitchen-ready crushed. Add about a quarter of a can of water. Let it simmer for 10 minutes or so. Now you're going to add the capers, the oregano, the pepper, salt and pepper, the chopped Italian parsley, and rough chopped pitted Kalamata olives, right? Do not mix black and Kalamata. Use one or the other. There's no need to add a lot of salt because the anchovies are very salty, so taste it first. Um, if you like, if you like, like a real hard bite, you can add some red pepper, but turn it to simmer, cover it, and just let it simmer. In the meantime, bring a pot of salted water to a rolling boil, add the linguine, uh, let it boil for eight minutes or so until you know it's al dente. Remove it, drain it, always keeping a mug full of the pasta water. Take a little bit of that pasta water, add it to the sauce, uh, and stir it around and mix it because once you put the pasta in the sauce, the pasta is going to suck up the sauce. So if you need to, you can always even add a little bit more water uh, to the sauce just to keep it nice and moist, right? You want it, you don't want to put too much water in it and, uh, and um, uh, thin it out too much, but you want to put enough that you keep it so, you know, so that you keep it kind of saucy, right? You want to serve it immediately uh, into warm bowls, serve it to your guests, and then have plenty of fresh grated Parmigiana cheese on the table because you can never have enough grated, fresh grated Parmigiana cheese. And anyway, uh, in any event, I hope you enjoyed this recipe today. It's not that difficult to make. It is really, really delicious. It made for a great Saturday night dinner. We had some friends over um, and we made that as our first course. And then, you know, if you saw the pictures, then I made uh, a pan-seared oven roasted veal chop, which was also delicious. In any event, the sun is up. As you can see, it's coming right in this window and it's creating this beautiful um, uh, view in the back. Uh, as we prepare for another day. 8.30 is coming. Stay on your toes. This is no time to fall asleep. Until then, until tomorrow, take good care.